let us notice four things in the beginning of this sermon. We noted a few minutes ago that they are accounting for the defection and betrayal of Judas by consulting scripture. They find a verse in Psalm 109. And as far as they're concerned, it's the Bible which explained what happened in terms of a tragedy in the local community. Now, there's a mighty rushing wind. There's cloven tongues of fire falling out of the sky. There are people speaking languages they've never learned to people who have learned the languages. How do they explain that? They explain it by consulting Holy Scripture. Peter cites a passage in Joel chapter 2. So the tragedy within the community, the prodigy over the city, are both explained the same way. They're explained by studying the Bible and discovering an explanation in the Bible to satisfy their, their questions, to answer their questions about what it is that's going on. Now, there's something else here. This sermon preached on the day of Pentecost is basically a sermon to the Jews and for the Jews. That's not always going to be the case in the book of Acts, but that's the case now. Peter says in verse 22, Acts 2:22, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Now, we, mo we mentioned a moment ago that Peter, in a very courageous way, is showing them that it's their fault. They were guilty. They were actually guilty in more than one way because he says in verse 22, you nailed him to the cross. But that's not all he says. He says that it was God's plan. Look at verse 23. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. That's Gentiles. You Jews killed the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, with the hands of Gentiles, and it's your fault. But he also says that this man, Christ Jesus, was delivered over to the Gentiles by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. What's he doing? Well, let me tell you that one of the greatest theological controversies which rages within the church is the controversy between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. As a matter of fact, there are two schools of theological thought among Christians, at least Christians who study doctrine and who teach doctrine and who care about doctrine. One school is called Calvinism. Calvinism emphasizes the sovereignty of God. One school is called Arminianism. Arminianism emphasizes the responsibility of man. Let me just say this. There was a great Baptist preacher called Spurgeon. He died in 1892. Spurgeon was asked, how do you reconcile divine sovereignty and human responsibility? Spurgeon's answer was, I don't reconcile them. There's no need to reconcile friends. What did he mean by that? The doctrine of God's sovereignty and the doctrine of human responsibility, the doctrine of God's sovereignty, man's responsibility, the doctrine of divine sovereignty, human responsibility, these two doctrines are not enemies. They are friends. It is possible for God to work His plan and His will through the decisions of wicked men in such a way that men are still wicked. God is still good. Men are still responsible 
and God is still sovereign. And that's exactly what happens in the death of Christ. Yesterday I asked you a question. We were talking about Genesis 50, 20, when Joseph says to his brothers who sold him into slavery, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It's the exact same principle. The Jews who insisted that the Gentiles kill Jesus, the, G the Gentiles who killed Jesus, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And I told you that Genesis 50, 20 is the Old Testament version of the same truth expressed in Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. And I ask you, what's the worst thing that ever happened? It's the murder of the Son of God. And then I said, what's the best thing that ever happened? Christ died for me. It's the same thing. Is there human wickedness involved in the death of Christ? Absolutely. Was the, do, was the death of Christ the product of divine goodness? Absolutely. Was there human responsibility for the death of Christ? Absolutely. Was the death of Christ on the cross a product of divine sovereignty? Absolutely. And you see, Peter preaches those two truths in the same verse. It's not necessary to de deny one in order to keep the other. It's not necessary if we keep one to deny the other. It's not necessary. Peter holds them both, one in each hand. He says in verse 23, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, that's divine sovereignty. That's divine goodness. You nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You did it. That's human responsibility. That's human wickedness. Don't throw one of them away. Hold both of them in your hands. That's what Peter does. That's what the Bible does. Maybe you don't understand how it fits together. Well, what do you understand about God? You understand how God can have no beginning? You understand that? You understand how God can be Trinitarian? Three in one and one in three? You understand that? You understand how Christ can be fully God and fully man at the same time? I don't think you do. We can believe many things that we don't completely understand. Scientists don't understand how light can be both particles and waves at the same time, but they believe it. I don't understand electricity, but I never sit in the dark. I never say, well, it's night, now I can't read. I turn on the light. I don't understand what happens when I turn on the light, but I believe that it does happen. We can advance in our knowledge of the eternity of God. We can advance in our knowledge of the Trinity. We can advance in our knowledge of Christ being fully God and fully man. And we can advance in our knowledge of the correspondence between divine sovereignty and human responsibility. But we can believe the doctrine before we understand it completely. And from the very beginning of the Christian age, on the day of Pentecost, and the first sermon that was preached, after the Holy Spirit fell, Peter declares both doctrines to be true. This was God's plan, and you killed him, and you're guilty. He preaches both. He says in verse 24, But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. Now, when Peter says that Christ put an end to the agony of death. Peter is not just talking about Christ's own death. He's talking about your death, and he's talking about my death. Hold your place in Acts 2 and turn to Hebrews 2. I want to show you something. You know, I don't know which verses are famous in Russia. 
because I don't go to church in Russia. One of my problems is that usually when I go to church, I'm the one preaching. So I don't always know what's being preached in churches. I only know what I'm preaching. But I just want to say to you that there are two verses in Hebrews 2 which are almost never talked about in the West. They're almost never talked about. And that's a pity because these two verses are among the most important verses in the New Testament. One reason they're important is because they talk about the reason that Christ came. Anytime you see a reason given for why Christ did something, especially the reason that he came to this earth, it's a very important verse. John 10:10, 10, 10, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, John 19:10. The Son of Man came not to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ giving reasons why he came. Very important verses. Well, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 give us a reason why he came. Why did he take on human nature? Verse 14 speaks of flesh and blood. And it says that, he himself also took on flesh and blood. Why did he take on flesh and blood? Why did he become a man? Why did he take a human body? He took a human body so he could die a human death. He took on our humanity that he might take on our mortality. The whole reason he took on human flesh is so that human flesh might die. But it might die a particular kind of death. Now look at what it says. He partook of flesh, look at this, that he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. That in dying, he would take the power of death from the devil. And look, and that he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Men and women without Christ are slaves. They are slaves to fear. Fear of what? Fear of death. Those of us who know Christ are free. Free of what? F free of fear. Fear of what? Fear of death. And this is the exact subject that Peter begins the sermon with. What, is the what does the resurrection of Christ mean? It means that he is put an end to the agony of death. And then he said it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Here's what Spurgeon said in 1880, preaching in London. I'm going to read this to you. The dignity of Christ's person made it impossible that he could be held by the courts of death apart from the consent of his own will. For even though Jesus Christ was truly human, his humanity was in so close alliance to the Godhead that Jesus Christ himself is altogether divine. It could not be that a body in which dwelt the fullness of the Godhead could be held by the bonds of death. He who slept in Joseph's tomb, that is the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he who slept in Joseph's tomb was the Son of God. It was he who is without beginning of days or end of years, he with whom Jehovah took counsel when he laid the foundations of the heavens and built all the worlds, for without him was not anything made that was made. It was not therefore possible that he could be held by death. Marvelous condescension. Not human weakness brought him into the sepulcher. It was by his own free will that he laid in the tomb. And consequently, he had but to exert his royal prerogative, that is the choices he could make because he's king, that he could rise again from death whenever he pleased. That's Spurgeon preaching on the fact that death could not hold Christ 
He must be raised from the dead. And Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. He says that God raised Christ up and put an agony into the agony of death because it was impossible for death to be held in his power. Peter attributes the fact of the resurrection to a prophecy of David. What Peter is saying is that the resurrection of Christ is not a shock. It's not a surprise. It's not something that no one had ever thought of. It's not something that they'd never been told before. And Peter begins to quote Psalm 16. You see, he comes back to Scripture. They go to Scripture in Psalm 109 to understand what's happened to Judas and what should happen in replacing Judas. He goes to Scripture in Joel chapter 2 to explain the phenomenon on the day of the phenomena on the day of Pentecost. Now he goes to Scripture to explain the phenomenon of the resurrection of Christ. In Psalm 16, I saw the Lord always in my presence. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Verse 26. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted, therefore exalted. There, moreover, my flesh also will live. He's saying that what David said in Psalm 16 was said of Christ. Christ did not give in into despair, even though he was dying, because he knew he was going to live. My flesh will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Christ's body would die but Christ's body would not decay. It would not turn into ashes. It would not be consumed by worms. Christ's body would live again. You have made known to me the ways of life. You have made me full of gladness with your presence. Okay, that's the quote from Psalm 16. Then Peter says, My brothers, David could not have been talking about himself because we know that David died and we know that David is buried and we know that David did not rise again. We know that David's body did decay. So he wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about his son. He was talking about the Christ, the Messiah. He was talking about this same Jesus. David died and he was buried, verse 29. We actually know where he's buried. And so, because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, again, he's quoting the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 7, David looked ahead, verse 31. David looked ahead, and he spoke of the resurrection of Christ when he said he has neither abandoned to Hades he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor was his flesh allowed to decay. And he says in verse 32, This Jesus God raised up, and we all saw it. We were all witnesses. What's he saying? Listen. He's saying, listen, we know Christ was raised from the dead. How do we know? Because we saw him. We saw him. There are many people here who saw him who spoke with him, who ate with him. We know that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now the ascension has take, taken place. Ten days ago, Christ was not only raised from the dead on the third day, he was raised from the earth 40 days later. And now the Holy Spirit has come. And he says in verse 33, Jesus, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. He's saying Christ has been raised up, and because Christ has been raised up, the Holy Spirit has been sent down. That's what he's saying. That's what he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. And then he talks about the ascension. He says, it was not David who ascended into heaven. David said in Psalm 110, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
See, David's not talking about himself. He's talking about Christ. Therefore, let all the house of Israel, verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus of Nazareth, both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Now let me just tell you something. Stephen preached basically the same thing in chapter 7. And they killed him. Peter preaches this on in Acts 2. And they're converted. 3,000 of them were converted. What's the difference? Did Stephen not know how to preach? Did Stephen not know how to preach with good manners? Did Stephen not know how to preach without making somebody mad? Well, you know, one day they're going to kill Peter, but not today. Today, 3,000 people are going to be saved. When we preach the gospel, we never know for sure where people, whether people are going to believe the gospel or whether people are going to kill us. Only God knows. You know what? That's not really our business. It's not our business to be successful witnesses. It's our business to be faithful witnesses. And the very faithfulness of our witness may hasten our death. We may actually go to heaven sooner because we're faithful instead of later. But on this day, it says in verse 37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? This is one of the great gospel verses of the New Testament. It's right up there with John 3.16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, Titus 3, 5, John 1, 12. Peter said to them, Repent. Each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, um, I don't want, there are two things I don't want to do. Number one, I don't want to make your pastors mad. Number two, I don't want to be your pastor. If you come to if you come live in Budapest, I'll be happy to be your pastor. But I don't want you to live in Russia and me to live in Hungary and for me to be your pastor. You've already got a pastor or you ought to have a pastor. So when I talk about doctrinal controversies, I'm not trying to take the place of your pastor. I'm just trying to teach through the book of Acts. There are many church leaders who look at Acts 2.38 and they say, you have to be baptized to be saved. That's not what it's teaching. That's not what it's teaching. If we are saved by baptism, then we are saved by works because baptism is a work. Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you. Well, if baptism saves a person, could Paul possibly say that? There are also many verses that say that, that we're saved by grace, that we're not saved by works. So here's what that means. The act of baptism does not save us. Let's say you become a Christian and you're going to be baptized this Sunday. 
but you're in a traffic accident and you're killed. You're killed on the way to your baptism. Well, let me put it this way. Let's say one person is killed in a traffic accident on the way to his baptism. And let's say another person is killed in a traffic accident on the way back from his baptism. The second person has been baptized. The first person has not. Does the second person go to heaven and the first person go to hell? No. Both go to heaven if they've trusted Christ as their Savior. It's not the baptism itself which saves us from sin and death and hell. Now, if you ask me the question, would a truly saved person refuse to be baptized? I would answer that in this way. I would never encourage a person who is refusing to be baptized to believe that he's really saved. Why would anyone want to be disobedient if they're really saved? Why would you, why you say why would you say Christ I want your crown but not your cross? I want the fruit of obedience but I don't want the responsibility of the commandment. I want to receive your promises, but I don't want to do what you say. Why would anybody say that? So baptism does not save us. Baptism alone does not save us. It's faith in Christ's work on the cross and His resurrection which saves us. But anyone who, is, who has truly exercised that faith will want to obey the command to be baptized. And baptism is a command. And here we see it on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38. You notice that repentance is also here. And in the Russian churches, at least in some of the Russian churches, you talk about repentance all the time. As a matter of fact, that's what you call salvation. I've heard many Russians not say when I was, when I was saved or when I converted or when I came to faith. They say when I repented. And I think that's really a good thing. I think that's an emphasis that we need more in the West because we don't talk much about repentance in the West. We say when I became a Christian or we say when I received Christ or we say when I was converted. We don't say when I repented. But we ought to say that because that's what Peter says. What should we do now that we know that we're guilty of the death of Christ? We should repent. Repent is to change. Repent is a, is a, a change of direction. I repented. I was going to hell, but I've changed my direction. Now I'm going, I'm going to heaven. I've repented. I used to think I could make it through this life without Christ, but now I've changed. I've changed my mind. Now I know I can only make it if I do have Christ. The word repentance in Greek is the word metanoia, and it means a change of mind. Not just a change of mind, but a change of mindset, a complete change, a change which has changed the whole life. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300.
or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.